heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And alongside her for one more day, I'm Ed Ludlow, also in New York. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll get a read on the health of the tech labor market. That is U.S. jobs report comes in hot. It is there with the read through into Silicon Valley. We'll discuss. Plus, we stick on the topic of jobs. A new filing shows Apple slashed around 600 rolls after scrapping its car and screen projects. We'll bring you that Bloomberg reporting. And Meta changes its policies around artificial intelligence to allow more AI-generated content to remain on its platforms. We'll discuss that and so much more throughout this hour, but we turn our attention to the macro picture. And I'm not just talking about a obsessed with an earthquake New York right now. I look at the macro picture that's happening. The earthquake that was the jobs data, and it was strong, 303,000 being added, and it manages to push actually stocks higher. This good news actually managing to still be good news for the stock market, even though we do still see a sell-off in the bond market continuing up some six, seven basis points. For now, there seems to be an idea that with this jobs and this strong, resilient U.S. labor force more broadly, that can be seen as non-inflationary when you dig into some of the NFP numbers. The wage inflation really wasn't a picture there. I'm looking at the Bloomberg US dollar index, though higher against basically most of the FX pairs. Keep an eye on what's happening with the Dallas Fed president at the moment, though. We're getting some headlines coming through from Laurie Logan, who's actually saying, look, hold your horses. We're not going to be having any sort of rate cuts anytime soon. So that might actually just dampen a little bit of the risk on tone that we've had to this Friday trade. Move on and have a look at what key at risk asset is also on the move. Actually, Bitcoin down some 3.8% over the course of a five trading days. And even though we see a little bit of an uptick in the last day or so, as other risk assets just managed to catch up a little bit, we are still seeing a strong US dollar impact some of the inflows into Bitcoin and, of course, what's been happening on the ETF side of things. But, Ed, what are you watching on more of the macro picture? Just the basics of the jobs numbers, 303,000. That's hot. The estimate, 214,000. Worth noting that there was also an upward revision to 22,000 net for the prior two months. Uh, on the money, when it came, comes to wages or earnings, as you said, uh, you know, we'll think about what this means for specific tech names uh, in just a moment. But I think that it's good news in the sense corporate America is looking great, you know, powering the economy. But the concern clearly is the timing of, of, of a Fed rate cut, higher rates discount the present value of future cash flows, as we always say on this show. And the market right now pushing out that rate cut bet to September from July. That's kind of where my head's out right now. Certainly. Let's just get our heads around what happened with the jobs number, what it means for a labor force, particularly in the technology sector. LinkedIn Head of Economics Americas, Corey Katanga, is joining us. For, look, your take on the numbers, because all we've had inbound-wise is companies becoming more contained with their hiring, more focused on just the AI part of the equation, and ultimately letting people go. What do you make of the fact that still we've got such a resilient jobs market, Corey? Well, today's number was a solid number. It's important to keep in mind that the jobs number in terms of total jobs added has actually been fluctuating on average between two and 300 since June 2023. So we're actually seeing a fair amount of steadiness in the labor market in terms of the number of jobs added. When you think about what's happening in the tech sector, we're seeing that the tech sector has also been sort of stabilized since June 2023. Based on our data at LinkedIn, we've seen that the pace of hiring at tech has leveled out. It's still well below what it was before the pandemic, but it, we are no longer seeing you know, massive drop-offs in terms of hiring in tech. Corey, let, let's stick with that. So the pace of hiring in technology has leveled off according to your data. Therefore, it's not a big contributor to that 303 we saw this morning, the sector, I mean. That's right. Two-thirds of that 303 is coming from just three sectors, government, leisure and hospitality, government. hospitals and healthcare. That's the case this month. That was the case last month as well. I'm also interested in, in, in money, wages, earnings, call it what you will. Cara and I pointed out, you know, on estimates, but we're not hearing that, particularly in the context of AI. We heard from Brad Lightcap, the COO of OpenAI, on the show yesterday. There is a talent war, and a net result of talent war is usually you've got to pay more, either in cash or in stock. What's your data telling you? Well, certainly 
for AI roles, we're talking about technical AI roles, not just roles that may use AI. For those technical AI roles, there's a shortage of supply of workers. That has been growing. We've seen in LinkedIn data that the number of workers who have those technical AI skills has been rising and rising rapidly, but it hasn't been able to keep up with the demand for these workers. So that's driving wages up, and companies are going to consider other options, right? They're also going to look for other places like Brazil and India. Where can they find these workers with these technical skills in order to build AI tools and how? to foster productivity and innovation, but also manage to keep some control on their costs. Interesting. We're hearing, of course, that ultimately immigration is helping keep down that wage inflation pressure that's happening here in the United States as well. I wonder how many of those are coming into the tech sector. Is there talent coming in from abroad at the moment, do you think, Corey? So right now, we're not seeing a ton of talent coming into the tech sector. But we are seeing a recovery from the pandemic. So the pandemic really knocked off a lot of uh, movement within the, within the uh, tech sector. And we're starting to see those numbers come back up. Now, there is a gap that was created by the workers who didn't come in 2020, 2021. And so we're still not there in terms of making up the gap for those workers. But it's starting to come back at a level, at a pace that can help support that sector. What about diversity? I mean, this is something that we always need to keep a track on, but ultimately the disparity in wages that are going to people of color versus white workers, women versus men, how are the demographics shaking out at the moment? So one thing we've actually recently seen at LinkedIn, we've done an analysis that says, when the labor market slows down, we see less women hired into leadership. And that's not a situation where less women are applying for leadership when the labor market slows down. They're applying more, but they're less likely to make their way into the top levels of leadership. So as the labor market slows down, it's very clear that everyone is disproportionately impacted. For example, the pandemic wiped out about five years of gains in the black-white unemployment gap. So as we continue to see some of the air being let out of the labor market, right now it looks stable. But if we do continue to see some air let out, as expected, until we start to see interest rates cut, that is certainly going to disproportionately impact workers. LinkedIn Head of Economics for America's Corey Contenga. It's great to have you back on the program. Thank you. Some important breaking headlines and an update. The FAA says there is a ground stop at JFK and Newark airports. In a statement, the FAA says a 4.8 magnitude earthquake in New Jersey may impact some air traffic facilities in New York, New Jersey, but also Philadelphia and Baltimore. Air traffic operations are resuming as quickly as possible. And for more real-time information, go to the official channels, but we'll keep you posted here on Bloomberg Technology as well. I'm one of those people due to fly back to the West Coast uh -oh. from one of those airports this <laughs> afternoon. Let's see what happens. And also stick with the job story for a moment. According to filings with the California Employment Development Department, Apple laid off more than 600 employees as part of the decisions to end its car and smartwatch display projects. For more, let's go out to Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. This is based on the warn notices, a really important place to look. What do we know, Mark? So we've known about the layoffs for quite some time. Obviously, we broke the news in February that the Apple car project uh, was being ended. And we also broke the news that the Apple micro LED display project related to next generation Apple watches was being ended. Now, the display project is less known, so let me explain it for a minute. This was an effort where Apple was custom designing its own screens for the first time. Typically, they relied on designs from Samsung, LG, what have you. For the first time, they were designing and test building, test manufacturing their own display displays at facilities in uh, Santa Clara in Silicon Valley, California. So both of those projects ending, the, the people or some of the people part of the projects being laid off, we've known that now, thanks to the war notices, we have a number. Uh, the total was 614 people, right, in California. Now, the layoffs were actually a lot higher than that. There was a big group of Apple Car employees working out of a secretive facility uh, in Arizona, outside Phoenix, at an old General Motors facility. And then in Asia, you had several hundred people also working on the display project. Mm. So in California, 614 people, but the layoffs probably a bit closer to 1,000. Mark, can you give us the context of what 1,000 is relative to how many employees Apple has? You know, Apple has about 180,000 employees, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less than that, but that is a rough estimate. But that includes both corporate and retail employees. Uh, on the on the corporate side, it's probably closer uh, to 70,000 employees, right? So a couple percentage points of the company. Again, these are not the mass 
layoffs that you've seen from some of the other companies in Silicon Valley. We're not talking about uh, 10, 18, 20, 30 percent here, but still for Apple, this is three major rounds of layoffs. And I say major, major contextually for Apple because they just don't do this, right? So you had uh, San Diego in January, 121 people. This was an office where they did annotation and testing uh, and improvement to Siri. They offered jobs to those people in Texas, uh, but you can probably count on one or two hands how many people will be moving from San Diego uh, to Texas for this role. And so that's 121 people. Then in February, another 614 people, plus the several other hundred in Asia uh, in Arizona. So it is quite notable for Apple that we've come to this point where they're killing R&D projects uh, and they're laying yeah. people off. Mark Gurman, we thank you so much for coming on in a day where you're meant to be resting. We thank you for spilling the beans when it comes to Apple. We've got some more stocks to watch at this moment. Paramount currently under pressure. Now, this is a we see reporting coming from CNBC that Skydance's unique offer for Paramount is a special committee has the company continuing to trade publicly. But get this, ultimately the offer coming from Skydance will mean that the new equity will be dilutive for existing shareholders, but will align voting and economic control in a way that hasn't been the case with the Redstone family. Of course, this is as we see Skydance taking over that Redstone, Sherry Redstone element of control over Paramount's parent company shares. Keep a close eye on this potential deal. We're down 4.5% after a rally yesterday. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, some breaking news on the Bloomberg. Reuters is reporting that Tesla has completely scrapped plans for a low-cost car. I'm going to repeat that. Reuters is reporting that Tesla has scrapped plans for a low-cost car. You can see on your screen the reaction. The stock is now down almost 5%. Um, the, the idea was that there was a model nearer to $25,000 US dollars coming. It is something that Tesla has flipped flopped on over the years. There was a big impetus to do it 2018 to 2020, 21. They then kind of delayed that. Then it was back on the table. Reuters is citing sources uh, on this story. Uh, you know, we will get on the phone and get on the emails and, and ask Elon Musk and other executives uh, whether this is true or not. But I, the Reuters report, Caroline, is that the pivot now is that Tesla goes back to focusing on robo taxis. Precisely. This was the original thesis. Yeah. Build a vehicle that ownership's not important. You know, the idea where the consumer pays $25,000, that's not what they were looking for. Yeah. They were looking for control of the fleet. And look, this where, is Tasha Kearney and the entire focus at Arc. Long term, this is a 2006 master plan coming that was you, originally that you build expensive cars, then go to cheaper cars. But 25000 just seems to be all too much. You're going to stick more to a $39,000 entry level. It cites, interestingly, in Reuters, the competition coming from China in particular, for example, BYD. Do you think that's what the case here, or is it just an element of margin and profitability here, Ed? Here's the thing. We're supposed to be between two waves. The Model 3 and Y wave is gone. The next wave, as Elon Musk outlined mm. it at the last earnings, was to be built on the cheaper model. So, so l let's, be, let's be patient. The stock is reacting. Um, and a lot of investors are going to say, I'm a long-term shareholder. I'll hold for the long term because they're actually pricing in more the software and robotaxi thesis anyway. We'll bring you more updates as and when we get them, Kara. We will. For now, let's just go to another key stock that's actually on the move today, to the higher side, Meta. But this is as the company is actually announcing it's changing its artificial intelligence policies. It's going to allow for more content generated by AI to remain on its platforms. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner. For ultimately the policy nuance here, they're going to allow it, but they'll mark it. That's right. So... A couple of years ago, they came out with this manipulated media policy, which basically said, you know, if someone uploads a video that makes it look like you, Caroline, are saying something you didn't actually say, it's been AI generated to sort of mislead people, that they would take that down. And now what they're saying is they're going to leave it up, but they're going to label it. And the idea being that if those types of videos do not violate a different rule within the company, if the only sort of, uh, uh, you know, issue is that it was AI generated, they're going to leave it up even if it is misleading. Now, these things could still be fact checked right so there's a couple different ways that the company could sort of label these as ai uh, generated or misleading but they are going to leave them up instead of taking them down cut how does this differ from others well you know 
X, as we've seen, has sort of uh, they have a manipulated media policy as well. But it doesn't I'm not necessarily convinced that they're able to enforce these things in the way that they say they are. Um, you know, we've seen this happen with the 2020 election. We saw um, some manipulated videos and audio show up. We've already heard complaints that this might be an issue for 2024, right? So the reason we're following this news and, and why these policies matter, of course, even if it is a small number of actual posts that are impacted, mm. it's that those posts could be, you know, shared by President Trump, President Biden, major campaigns that are that are trying to influence this election. And so it's important that the company uh, figure this out before 2024 happens. OK, and this does come in such a political context. It comes in such a context at the moment of just generative AI being the flavor de jour. And it, are we seeing, ultimately, companies having to front run politicians and indeed regulatory change at this? We are, because there is no regulatory framework for how these companies should moderate uh, AI posts, but specifically generative AI. And so we've seen Nick Clegg at Meta come out publicly several times already in the last couple months and say, we need rules. We need uh, you know, government and regulators to basically come in and put some guardrails on this thing, because otherwise it's up to the companies themselves. And Meta, you know, to its credit, is, is trying to be proactive, or at least that's what they seem to be doing. Um, but, you know, unless there's anybody holding them accountable, holding YouTube and X and other platforms accountable, it's just every everyone for themselves here. And so, you know, they are doing this proactively because there is no uh, framework from the U.S. Or, or other governments, really. Kurt Wagner, we thank you all things meta now back to all things tesla what's the latest ed yeah so tesla shares down more than four percent here reuters is reporting that tesla has scrapped its plans for a low-cost car it fell down as much as 5.3 percent in the session the idea is that tesla is now going to pivot back to its previous strategy according to reuters reporting of focusing on self-driving robo taxis and you remember the original thesis for tesla was that they would manage these fleets we will track this one we'll bring you some updates this is bloomberg technology Shares of EV maker Tesla have dropped sharply in the last five minutes. Reuters is reporting, according to unnamed sources, that Tesla has scrapped plans for a lower cost EV. Uh, their Reuters report says that this is because Tesla wants to focus in part on making a robo taxi. Joining us out of London is our global autos czar and editor, Craig Trudell. Uh, Craig, just for some housekeeping, Bloomberg is contacting Tesla directly and all of our own reporting to try and work out the validity of this report, but it's moved markets. Uh, what do you know from the Reuters reporting and what do you make of it? Yeah, just, just reading the piece, I mean, it, it is uh, my first uh, reaction, I guess, was what? <laughs> uh, I, I do think that, you know, on one hand, it is not a huge shock in the sense that if anyone who read Walter Isaacson's biography last year, uh, you know, is familiar with this idea that Elon had to be talked into doing this model that he said back in 2020 he was going to do, he sort of, you know, wanted to talk himself out of it. He, he thought, you know what, we don't need to do that anymore because we will be able to build uh, self-driving vehicles, rendering this cheap car uh, useless because we're totally going to change the game. The problem with that is that this guy has been trying to do this now for going on eight years, has been selling, you know, quote unquote, full self-driving uh, for that long a time, and he just doesn't have it. Uh, it absolutely is a, a, an, an increasingly capable system. It's impressive at times. It blows some people's minds. At other times, though, it, it completely doesn't work. It's, it's not safe. He himself, you know, uh, issues this dictate to his employees uh, that they need to demonstrate this before every sale. And even him, he himself puts in his email internally that uh, this is a supervised system. So this is a company that is a long way from being able to offer a robo taxi. And so this this idea that they would cancel an affordable car that they desperately need uh, is just really hard to believe. Let's just talk about the desperate need 
Craig, because some citing the ongoing competitive threat coming from players such as BYD in China, China. the fact that we've got Xiaomi now coming into the EV space, is that the competitive threat that's really uh, antagonizing the, the cost perspective here? I mean, it, we only have to look at the numbers that came out this week to see that the Model 3 and Model Y, they are just running out of the ability to squeeze more juice out of, out of those two. Uh, the, the fact that uh, in China they are losing share to a company like BYD that, you know, has models as low as under $10,000. Uh, the, the way that the China market is going is lower, lower. Uh, and as much as, as Tesla has uh, priced its, its Model 3, you know, much, uh, you know, less expensively over the last, you know, year plus, they're still a long way from a lot of their competitors in that market. Uh, not to mention, you know, in other parts of the world, it, even in the U.S., where it's been, you know, a, a dominant player for quite a long time, remains, you know, uh, 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 in control of more than a majority of, of EV sales in the States. Yeah. It's still getting more competitive and is difficult for them to yeah. compete with their their uh, least expensive model being more than $35,000. So, so I want to go to something that Dana Hall was writing about last week, I believe, Craig. I think you edited it. This idea that they were going to manufacture their way to a $25,000 EV. They told us all of this. They were going to change how that EV was built. So, so, so I go back to the idea. It's hard to believe they're outright scrapping a, a $25,000 US dollar or lower price point, price point EV when they, they communicated quite clearly how they do it. Yeah, and, and I don't uh, see a sort of, you know, clear, it, it would be hard to, to fathom that they could move to this unboxed assembly approach that Dana wrote about last week with an existing vehicle. Uh, it, it just, you know, it, it's not the sort of thing you do. Uh, perhaps they could uh, completely rewrite things, but, you know, this is not the sort of move that you make that inspires confidence on the part of investors. This right. Uh, suggests that you're you're kind of flailing when when times are tough. Oh, and on the day that they've just been marking down the Model Y SUV yeah. once again as well, it just feels like the pile on is continuing, and no wonder this is the worst performing stock in the SME 500 so far this year. Just really, Craig. Just very lastly, what's the next iteration we should look out for? I think we should look out for uh, for more price cuts uh, on the front end. This is a company that tried to kind of play a different approach in, to its pricing by you know, doing a temporary discount that was going to you know, go away on April 1st. They yeah. stuck right. to that. I, it, it's not going to last. <laughs> Craig Trudell, we thank you so much. We've got some big conversations coming up after the break. You want to stick with us for a deep dive with the CEO of Levi's. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde. Okay, a quick update. An earthquake rattled northern New Jersey on this morning, shook building offices in Manhattan and was felt on Long Island and in New York's Hudson Valley. Preliminary reports say it's a 4.7 magnitude tremor. New York Governor Kathy Hochul posting about the quake, saying her team's assessing impact and damage. Headlines also out that President Biden has been briefed. Caroline. You local San Franciscans are just going to be like, what are they worrying about? Let's get a quick check on these markets, meanwhile, because we are currently seeing, well, overall, the market has been managing to trade higher, despite the fact that we're, well, seeing really strong labor market here in the United States. 303,000 jobs added. Nevertheless, the Nasdaq rise is up more than a percentage point, even though 10-year yields rise some six basis points. The Bloomberg dollar index continues to hold some ground. It was up against every single FX pair today, but it's actually just dialing back a little bit. This is all about Fed policy, whether or not in the face of a very resilient U.S. economy, we will see those rate cuts coming as soon as June. Market starts to doubt that. But look on and see what the key story in terms of well micro on a tech perspective is right now because we have been looking at what's been ultimately a case with Tesla. This is reporting coming from Reuters. The share price is under pressure as you'll see by more than 5.5%. This as we understand according to three sources that Reuters is saying that the affordable car plans so $25,000 entry models are being scrapped. Instead, there's a refocus back on the robo-taxi platform that has always been within the master plan. But 
Bloomberg at the moment trying to understand the veracity of these reports and we'll bring it to you as and when we can. Ed, what have you got? Okay, check this out for a second. So it looks like I'm not the only Bay Area local spending some time in New York City this week. That was Levi's CEO, Michelle Gass, ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange earlier today, just days after the company reported earnings, but also a significant milestone or anniversary since the IPO, five years. Uh, interesting, lifting EPS forecast for the full year, reporting adjusted net income for the first quarter that beats estimates, discipline, cost cutting. There's a bigger story out there, and it's Beyonce. Delighted to say <laughs> that Levi CEO Michelle Gass joins us on set. Thanks uh, for having me, Ed. Caroline, uh, thrilled to be here. I think we should just get right to Beyonce. <laughs> uh, to, to those who are living under a rock or perhaps didn't see it, yeah, Beyonce dropped the track list first mm -hmm. for her new album. One of the titles was Levi's Jeans. There was an extra eye in there. That must be quite a boost you got this week. Well, I mean, let me just say, we are just so honored that someone like Beyonce, who is a global icon, a, a culture shaper, would name a song after us. Um, completely organic, by the way, Ed. So, uh, but we... Well, hold like on. Said, what do you mean by completely or, organic? Organic. That we didn't have anything to do with her naming I a song see, I after see what us. You mean. Yeah. But... But that being said, I will say, I mean, to me, you know, one of the things that's so critical about Levi's, I mean, we've been around for 107 years, deep heritage, authenticity, but it's so important that we remain at the center of culture, yeah. right? We're a, very, we're a very inviting brand. We resonate with so many different people. Um, to be at that center of culture and have that youthfulness and relevance, and there's no better testament to being at the center of culture to have someone like Beyonce actually on her own name a song after us. What so we are just thrilled. has that done? to sales in the last week or so. Can you give so, us it's so, you know, so, so very early, but I think it's, it's part of, I think the bigger thing that's happening right now is Levi's is having a great moment. I mean, you just mentioned we were so pleased to start the year off so strong, exceeding expectations inside and externally, but underneath that, a lot of goodness. Um, the denim category, after some volatility the last couple years, has stabilized. We're expecting the category to grow globally in the mid-single digits. Importantly, Levi's is growing share. So in the U.S., we're going share with men's and women's, with youth, um, with the middle-income consumer, which is a great bellwether to the health of the consumer. And, uh, you know, as we think about our business kind of driving that optimism, I'd first say it's our direct-to-consumer. Yeah. Um, that business up now for eight consecutive quarters, up 8%. And also what's driving that is what's happening in denim. Like Levi's is having a moment, denim's having a moment, head-to-toe denim dressing. We're leading in trends. So as we think about our men's and women's business, loose fits, baggy fits up 40%. Our tops are exceeding expectations. Dresses, skirts, denim skirts up triple digits. So really, when you look underneath the hood, there is a lot of great things to be excited about, hence why we raised expectations for the year. And there's a lot to be said for the plans that you've put in place. Now, you say that you had nothing to do with Beyonce's naming of a song, but actually Levi's did back in the day because they were one of the only key brands that would affiliate themselves with Destiny's Child. And so ultimately, she comes from this place of authenticity. You come from a place yes. of leveraging it from an influencer perspective. We see how you rebrand the Instagram handle for the day to be a double I. What do you therefore do with the direct-to-consumer sort of online element of this? Because I now buy my Levi's via Amazon. How much have you yeah. been, we're a tech show, how much has technology been where it's yeah. at for you? No, I think that's great. I mean, testament to a really talented marketing and social media time team, I mean, when that happened instantly, they got after it and to your point, leveraged that branding and social media. And we've had over a billion impressions since they got after that that day, just to give you a sense. But being di direct to consumer is really omni-channel. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about our e-commerce business, that was up with double digits on top of double digits. I mean, that business is on fire, but it's all connected. And as we connect with our consumer online and in our stores, all ships raise. Um, and you made, a, you made a comment about Amazon. We want people to buy Levi's wherever they want to. I mean, we love it when they're engaging in the store because they can see the full expression, right? They can see all the new fits. Our talented stylists can help them find their next favorite pair of jeans or the next great top that goes with it. 
But, you know, as many stores, and we have 3,000 stores now globally, 1,000 which are company owned and operated, and we're intending to build a lot more, 100 uh, net new stores this year, one of which, by the way, is that we're relocating um, at the Champs Elysees just in time mm -hmm. for the Olympics. It's going to be a beautiful this store this summer um, before the Olympics. And so we'll have those flagship stores, but lots of stores that are coming into neighborhoods. But we're not going to be everywhere. So people can buy their, you know, their Levi's wherever they like to shop. Okay, so re really quick, a, a yes or no, not answer if you won't give me a number. Did Beyonce result in an uptick of sales this week? <laughs> I'm not going to give you a number. Okay, so let me ask but you But like I just said, being in the center okay. of culture is a privilege and we lean into let it. Let me ask you this really quickly. You talked about Paris. Our city, San Francisco, is still facing location issues where people are shutting stores. Mm -hmm. Would you ever com contemplate that in San Francisco? We, um, well, first of all, our headquarters are in San Francisco. We are here to stay. We've renewed our lease in our headquarters. We are deeply committed to San Francisco. We have a beautiful flagship store on Market Street, um, and they're doing great. So we are, we are committed to San Francisco and being part of the solution to, to bring back the vibrancy to this amazing city. It is so good to have you here, yeah, talking really of San Francisco, awesome. but in the house in New York, both of you flying back later today. It's a joy to have Levi's CEO, Michelle Gass, at this moment where, well, it's a Levi's on trend. Let's just talk about what else is top of mind for many of you who are about to fly out. Some updates on the earthquake here in the East Coast. JFK Airport posting on X that the airport does remain open and operational. Again, preliminary reports say that a 4.8 magnitude tremor rattled northern New Jersey with Manhattan, Long Island, Hudson Valley also feeling the impact. We're going to continue to monitor the headlines for you, bring you the latest, most importantly for you, Ed, because I know you're about to board a plane. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to keep looking at Tesla here. Um, this is interesting. Guys, let's bring up the shares. Uh, we're now pairing the decline quite significantly, down 2% from more than 5 5.5%. Uh, the markets and participants changing their mind. I don't see... Ah, here we go. Musk says Reuters is lying in report on low-cost EVs. We'll get that headline ready, but Elon Musk has just stated that Reuters is lying in that report, and that is why Tesla shares are pairing their gains. Uh, stick with us. There's a lot going on. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, an update from Elon Musk. In a post on X responding to someone else who had posted the Reuters headline, Musk says Reuters is lying again in brackets. The reaction in the markets is that we went from a decline of more than 5%. We're now trading down 2.6, 2.7%. So we're still in negative territory. Reuters had reported that Tesla was scrapping plans for a $25,000 or low-cost EV in favor of, of favoring robo-taxis. Elon Musk taking to his own social platform, X, to say that they are lying. But, as I keep saying, Carrie, the, the stock has not paired all of its decline. We're still down 3%, which will have an impact at the end index level. We will keep you up to date with all the goings on with Tesla. Now, let's get you all the goings on when it comes to artificial intelligence and how Cloudflare is letting more developers bring their own AI applications from Hugging Face onto its platform. Now, the company made the announcement this week, and it's also making its serverless GPU-powered inference, known as Workers AI, generally available. Let's bring in Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince, who I'm so pleased can always make these things far more simple than some of the jargon that we have to say. And I'm more interested, ultimately, there has been this desire by all companies to leverage the power of generative artificial intelligence. And what we keep having to talk about is not only how you integrate that within your workflow, but also how expensive it can be. You're trying to make it less expensive, make it more easy to adopt, to build your own AI apps, right? That's exactly right. There is not one AI solution for every company. We don't think it's one size fits all. And so we're excited to be partnering with Hugging Face, which is effectively the marketplace for the latest AI models. And we've made it incredibly simple for a vast majority of the Hugging Face models that are on that marketplace. Anyone who can bring anything to that marketplace, who with one click, deploy those models across the Cloudflare network and get the best performance from those models, but also the best costs. How can you actually 
get the value of AI without blowing your budget. You're a connectivity cloud company. What's brilliant about the perspective you have is a bird's eye perspective. You can see where trends are actually meeting reality. And there is so much hype that we talk about on this program day in, day out, Matthew. How real is that hype? How much are you actually seeing companies embrace generative AI and make real differences? I think that, you know, the generative AI story, you know, pick your sports metaphor, but it is in its earliest innings. Uh, and, and there's something real here. Um, but I think it's going to take a while for us to take what are really great demos and turn them into really great products. So I don't think I think that the, the hype, the excitement is justified. But I also think that we're going to be in a period of time where companies are going to have to experiment. They're going to have to try different things. They are have to try different models. They're going to have to try things that make sense for them. And so it's critical to be able to bring the right AI that your company needs and do it in the most cost effective way. And that's what we're, we're here to deliver at Cloudflare with our workers AI platform. What we're talking about is an AI supply chain. Yesterday, OpenAI's COO Brad Lightcap joined us on the show, and this is what he said about an AI supply chain. The supply chain will need to adapt to what we think is going to be uh, this highly inflected and, and nearly exponential demand in the next 10 years. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time thinking about ways that uh, we can make sure that that demand is met. Part of it is just being able to bring our models to bear, but upstream of that is obviously making sure that the actual underlying hardware and infrastructure exists to be able to build the systems that we need to ultimately serve that demand. Here's the thing, Matthew. Are you convinced that your potential customer base has even worked out in what form their demand is, what they actually plan to do with generative AI? I don't think that they've they've figured exactly out. I think everybody uh, in in the business world today is at least experimenting in this space. If you're not experimenting in this space, you really risk running behind. But we want to make sure that those experiments are cost as cost effective as possible. We don't want people to just be lighting money on fire when they're running AI experiments. And so we want to make sure that they have the models that make the most sense for their business. They're able to deploy them in the way which is the most cost effective uh, for their business. And they get the local requirements that Cloudflare's network gives. We've been able to deploy our GPU uh, inference powered machines today in more than 150 cities worldwide, making us the most widely distributed AI inference platform that's out there. And that's really powerful as we serve all our customers all around the world who want to be able to do inference locally. Why Hugging Face? Hugging Face is the de facto model for uh, the de facto marketplace for where you distribute different AI models. If you want to experiment with various AI models, they're the place to go. It's, it's sort of the GitHub uh, for AI today. And so they've been that place where developers are uploading those models, making it as easy as possible uh, for anybody to be able to distribute the incredible work that they're building with these AI tools. And that partnered with Cloudflare's network that makes now deploying that inf those, those models and using them to solve real business challenges anywhere in the world that's an incredibly powerful combination. And that's something that we're excited to be doing with them. And I think there's a lot more that we can do together. What's interesting about the time of AI is some of the anxiety that has given to the workplace, to whether they'll lose their roles. Now, Matthew, I want to dovetail into that, something that you've experienced recently and actually tackled head on in a very transparent manner. People having to be laid off in the tech sector. Now, one of your employees, a 27-year-old, was laid off and videoed how that occurred. It went viral and there was pushback as to the way in which people are being let go in the tech sector. You actually took to Twitter, now X, saying the video was painful for me to watch. Managers should always be involved. HR should be involved, but it shouldn't be outsourced to them. How have you seen response to your own response? How are you thinking about your own employee base, the three, more than 3,000 that you have with them at the moment? Yeah, you know, I think across the entire industry, um, COVID was this really strange period of time where I think for very reasonable and human reasons, um, a lot of companies just stopped firing people, uh, even if they didn't perform at their job. And so I don't want to talk about the specifics of any individual employee. That's not fair uh, to them. But I will say that we think it's really important that we have a culture of performance, that we have a culture of where people who do well are rewarded for that and people who aren't uh, we get off the team. That doesn't mean that they're bad people. They might be great employees somewhere else, but they may just not be the right fit for us. And what I'm encouraged by is that, you know, last year we had over 1.2 million people apply to work for Cloudflare for about a thousand jobs uh, that we hired for. We're way ahead of that trend through Q1 of this year uh, with a record number of applicants. We've never seen as many applicants. And so there are incredibly talented people who want to come 
work hard and deliver on the mission of helping build a better internet, including delivering things like our partnership with uh, Hugging Face and, and the AI platform, Workers AI. Okay, Cloudflare CEO, Matthew Prince. I appreciate uh, the candor on the question that Caroline asked, because on social media, that, that was widely shared. But also, you're doing something that I think we learned a lot about yesterday at Bloomberg Intelligence's AI Summit, partnerships to add a new layer of AI access on top of cloud infrastructure. That seems to be the thing. Matthew Prince, thank you so much. Okay, US and EU officials were in Leuven, Belgium, for the final Trade and Technology Council ministerial meeting before elections on both sides at the Atlantic, the Council, which is responsible for coordinating US and European tech regulation efforts, is working to set AI standards and to figure out how the two blocks can collaborate. Here's European Commission Executive Vice President Margrethe Vestager. When it comes to AI, we have had an agreed approach from the very first day. And I think that the likelihood that that will produce artificial intelligence that you can trust is so much bigger uh, because artificial intelligence holds immense promise if the negative sides uh, can be controlled. Yes, and meanwhile, the two sides also announced a new dialogue between the US AI Safety Institute and the EU's AI office that will explore tools and methods for evaluating technologies. Now, here's the US Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. AI is changing the game again for everything and, and AI collaboration between their office and our Safety Institute is strong, will get stronger, all led by the TTC. Now, away from diplomacy, coming up Twilio under activist investor pressure, now seeking board term changes. We'll have all the details. This is Bloomberg Technology. There could be some more changes at Twilio, spurred by pressure from activist investors. A software company is asking shareholders to change its board director terms to one year down from three. Beginning in 2025, the company also announced that Byron Dieter, director since 2010, will not seek re-election at its upcoming annual investor meeting. And the board is going to be reduced to nine members from ten upon the end of his term. There's one man to talk to, Bloomberg's Brody Ford. Uh, I, I actually kind of don't get this. Is this Twilio playing defense because there's a lingering yeah. threat? Or like, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, what this is, is Twilio seeking to avoid what happened with Disney. You know, a, a big public uh, dispute with activist investors where they're airing dirty laundry and you have to go on Twitter and take out ads to say, hey, vote for us, don't vote for the activist investors. What we're seeing here is a classic tale where a high growth software company hit a wall, right? They had their growth plummet. All of a sudden they had to do layoffs. Their future seemed uncertain. What happens? Activist investors show up, right? They mm -hmm. have been agitating for changes for a couple of months now. And we've seen Twilio make a number of changes over the last couple of months to keep these activist investors happy and to prevent getting themselves into some kind of public proxy battle, which very few people are willing to take on. Proxy battles is where it's at in the news flow right now at the moment, Brody. And I'm yeah. interested, like this, of course, comes after Jeff Lawson himself, CEO, had to stand down amid all of this. Is there now a viewpoint that ultimately the fundamentals of the business will be changing enough and swiftly enough? Mm. Well, that's a great question because we've seen some changes here. As you mentioned, the well-known founder CEO stepped down. They've changed some of the board terms. And when board terms are changed in this way where you can vote somebody out each given year, what that means is, hey, improve your business fundamentals or we're coming back next year and we can vote your slate of candidates out very easily. Right. We saw a statement yesterday from one of the activist investors saying we will continue to put pressure on this business. And keep in mind, these activists were hoping that right. Twilio would sell itself. They were hoping that it would divest things. So I think they were hoping for more drastic changes than we saw. So, you know, the odds yes. that we see some red headlines coming out about Twilio further, very possible.
Brody Ford, always a joy. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Meanwhile, wow, thick and fast on the headline front, Ed. Yeah, incredible Friday. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. You're going to have to recap the whole episode to understand what happened on the pod. Uh, what a week here with you in NY. This is Bloomberg.